Good morning, everybody. We will begin this morning with my reading of the personal meditation. In 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 12, Paul tries to inspire the Corinthian believers into giving generously, as the Macedonians had already done. He recognizes that giving is not something that can be prescribed by rules. What he does is to assume some common points of Christian experience. If the Corinthians' li lives have truly changed and they are devoted to following the Lord Jesus Christ, then they will have an eagerness to give their money and possessions for the good of the church. Wesley K. Wilmer, God and your staff. This time the prelude. Good morning. If there are any visitors with us, we greet you and please fill out the card in your pew. It is a pleasure to see the sun, but we really could use the rain. We put in a new lawn this year and it's not doing too well except that maybe our well will not be so well. Uh, yeah. We wish everyone a joyful day. The smells from the kitchen remind us that we are having a potluck. Please plan to join us downstairs after church. Bingo for some fun after the food. Please join me in our call to worship as found in your bulletin. Come into God's presence with thanksgiving in your hearts. Enter God's gates with praise. The Lord has made us glad. God's love endures forever. We join with all of creation to sing a new song. Rejoice, rejoice O my soul, soul. Again, again I say rejoice. rejoice. Let, Let us worship, worship God together. Please stand as you are able in body or spirit and sing with us hymn number 420, verses 1, 3, and 5, God of grace and God of glory.
be seated. Our call to confession. Our merciful and gracious God known, knows the reality of our lives. God knows our sinfulness already and loves us just the same. We confess to change our own hearts and to remind ourselves of our need of God's grace rather than to tell God something unknown. Trusting in God's grace and love, let us confess our sins, first in unison and then in the silence of our hearts. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Almighty God, you love us, but we do not love you fully. You call, but we do not always listen. We often walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We often condone evil hatred, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin, so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand as you are able, in body or in spirit, to join in the Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the the truth that in Christ our sins have been forgiven and knowing this we can find peace let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you please greet your neighbors with a sign of Christ's peace I do invite the kids forward when they, as they make their way through peace. Peace be with you. The Swartz girls. Let's wait for the adults to be seated. I really like your shoes, Avon. Avon has some really nice shoes on today for everyone who's wondering. Okay, so generosity is what the church is focusing on this month. Have you heard generosity before, the word? Yeah. 
It means being kind and generous. So what does being generous mean? Is that something you've heard before? Yeah. Do you have any idea of what generosity or generous means? <laughs> I, heard, I heard a phone a friend answer. <laughs> to be generous means to be willing to give more than it ex is expected or normally done. I got that from the dictionary. Yeah. There are lots of ways to be generous. I have a story of someone else's generosity from when I was about nine. My family, we were going through a period of really tough financial means. It was a really hard time for us financially. And my mom and my siblings and I were at McDonald's and we got a small something so that we could play in the play place because it was an indoor play place for the summer. It's very hot where I'm from. We were playing. And some very kind woman gave my mom $20. And with that $20, we were able to buy formula for my brother, who otherwise we don't know how we could have bought more for him. Right? So this woman's generosity really impacted our family. It really impacted me. Right? So giving above and beyond. We didn't know this woman. We weren't asking for money. She just saw our little family and saw all that we bought at McDonald's and put two and two together and gave my mom some money with which we could then feed my brother, who was an infant at the time. You may have not seen generosity like that in your life. Maybe you have, but maybe not. But you've likely seen generosity in some other ways, right? Like maybe the way someone helped a friend learn something in school. Like when I was in kindergarten, first grade, one of my friends taught me how to tie my shoes. <laughs> Right? Little things like that can also be aspects of generosity. Right? So there are so many different ways to be generous. And when we try to follow Jesus Christ, we try to live with generous hearts because Jesus is so generous to the world and to us even today. Jesus' love and generosity for the world is what inspires his followers to also be generous. That's what the Apostle Paul, who wrote lots of letters in the New Testament, says in our scripture reading for today. Jesus Christ is our ultimate example of generosity, and so we try to do our best to follow his lead. With that in mind, would you please join me in prayer? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for how generous you are with us. Help us to be generous to one another, to our church community, with our friends and family. May we share your love with this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for hearing a little bit of generosity. You can go hang out with Marlena now if you'd like. And I'd like to invite the choir forward, please.
Thank you, choir. That was lovely. Please join me in our prayer for illumination as found in your bulletin. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading from today is not from the Gospels, so my mistake, one of many typos in today's bulletin, so just roll with the punches with me on that one. Today's reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. This is written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, so... This is in the middle of the chapter. I'll be reading more of the chapter within the sermon itself. But this is how Paul is speaking to the church about giving. That's the point. Giving to the saints. If you read this in the scripture, you'll see the saints. That just means the people, the Christian community in Jerusalem. Your fun Bible fact for the day when Paul writes about the saints. He literally means the Christians in Jerusalem. With that in mind, let us jump on in to the text today. I do not say this as a command, but I am, by mentioning the eagerness of others, testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter, I am giving my own opinion, it is beneficial for you who began last year not to do, not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, as we come to this time of preaching of your word proclaimed, may we come together to know and learn the Holy Spirit's guidance for us as we consider generosity and what the year ne what next year will look like. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week was the first week of our stewardship sermon series, and the focus was on discipleship as stewardship, which, when taken out of church speak, means the way you follow Jesus is by taking good care of what you've been blessed with. Stewardship is to act as a steward. And we don't use that term, steward, very often anymore. In my still somewhat young brain, the last time a version of steward was still used regularly, regularly, was stewardess. And of course, the these were the women who helped the passengers on airplanes. And since that profession is no longer just women, they're now called flight attendants. It's in the shift of language from stewardess to flight attendant that we can see a glimpse of what stewardship means, right? It means to attend to something, to focus on something, to care for something. In the church, we think about stewardship more than any other organization or company because we're not a pay-to-play type organization, right? Think of Netflix, the gym, your cable and internet company, property taxes, hotels, camping facilities, golfing ranges, skiing slopes, your cell phone provider, the list can go on and on right, the places and things you have to pay to receive what is being offered to you. 
And the church isn't like that. We don't give you a bill that you must pay to come to worship or fellowship or like our special activity today, a potluck. We're also not a pay-as-you-go type situation, like think the grocery store or the gas station or Walmart, right? All the money that we take in is a free will offering, an offering from the heart. You could come to church for decades and not donate a cent, and you would still be welcome to worship in the community, to worship our Lord and Savior. I mean, this isn't always the case, right? And we didn't take this generosity just from our own heads. Because for a while, for a long time in the church, actually, the way the church made its income was not from a free will donation, but was by pew rental, as a fun fact. Your pew was your pew because you paid money for said pew. And that was how the church got its income. Like the little numbers on the pews, you see those? Some churches, it was names, and that was your family pew because you paid a certain amount for that pew. And that was your income. That was the church's income. That's how they ran. It wasn't an offering like we give today. So we get this action of not demanding a certain amount of money from each member or worshiper from Paul. Our reading today outlines this, though maybe not at first listen. You might, it might be kind of harder to understand. And so the book that I'm using in this series, God and Your Stuff, talks about our passage from 2 Corinthians today as a passage focused on giving according to your means. Let's listen to what Wellesley Wilmer says. Quote, in 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 12, Paul tries to inspire the Corinthian believers into giving generously, as the Macedonians had already done. Perhaps the first thing to notice in this passage is that Paul does not resort to asking for a tithe. This would be the perfect time for him to say, by the way, now that you all are Christians, you need to start tithing like it says in the Old Testament. He recognizes that giving is not something that can be prescribed by rules. What he does is to assume some common points of Christian experience. If the Corinthians' lives have truly changed and they are devoted to following the Lord Jesus Christ, then they will have an eagerness to give their money and possessions for the good of the church. Paul points out that he has witnessed this interchange in their lives and now asks that their giving follow that interchange. End quote. So this passage which we read today is about generosity. And in Paul's mind, that's what giving is about. Giving is about your own generosity. And he uses the story of generosity from the church in Macedonia, the Macedonians, to inspire a more thoughtful generosity in the Corinthian church. At the beginning of chapter 8, Paul writes this. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For, as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means. They gave themselves first to the Lord and, by the will of God, to us, that we might urge Titus that, as he had already made a beginning, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, we want you to excel in this generous undertaking. So Paul sees the good and great things the Corinthian church is doing. And he sees that they have a muscle that they still need to build. The muscle of generosity. He shares the story of the Macedonians giving abundantly with the little they have so that they could help support other Christians in Jerusalem. And stories of generosity still help to this day, right? Think of like the matching gifts in a fundraising campaign. Someone tells an organization, I'll match up to $5,000 of anything anyone else gives. So someone's generosity is then used 
to inspire other people to give to the organization too. Or, as we're seeing right now, with the recovery from the hurricanes uh, Helene and Milton, so many people are out there, boots on the ground, starting the initial wave of assistance for the areas affected by the storms. And people who can't be boots on the ground are giving to organizations that are assessing the needs of the people who've lost so much in these two storms. Which then inspires more people to do the same, right? It's like we get inspired by one another. And when we think more broadly, we can think of the support, the support that areas rife with warfare receive from other countries and from individuals. Stories of suffering and generosity inspire other people to give supplies or money or their own time. I know I'm often at least marginally inspired to give because I know other people are giving. That's not my sole inspiration for giving to an organization. I always want to make, always take time and care to make sure that I'm in alignment with other goals and functions around that organization I'm giving to. And so Paul lays out this plea for the church to give, not just by inspiring them with what another church community has done, he also reminds them of what Christ has done. The person they've come to know as their Lord and Savior. What he gave for them. Verse 9 says, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. My commentary from in my new study Bible, the Westminster Study Bible, says this about verse 9. The ministry and crucifixion of Christ are presented in economic terms, in which Christ's poverty enriches others. Paul is reminding the church that Jesus Christ, true God and true man, gave everything for the sake of the world. Gave up everything and lived an earthly life, died a gruesome death, and broke the power of sin and death in this world for their sake, for our sake. Verse 10 shows us that the Corinthian church already started a collection for Jerusalem a year ago. Yet Paul doesn't seem compelled to think that they've already co collected all that they could collect. And so he challenges them to re-envision what's possible for their community, for them individually, in verse 11. That call to finish the collection and for their eagerness to follow Christ, to be translated into what they can give in support of the Christians living in Jerusalem. As I read this verse, I see the Holy Spirit's active role in guiding that eagerness and matching it with what giving makes sense for the individuals who make up the church community. In the quote from God and your stuff already outlined, Paul doesn't give them a rule or a number to follow. Frankly, <laughs> it would be much easier if he did. It would be easier if Paul had said, in the Torah, God commanded the people of Israel to give the first tenth of their harvest back to God as part of their worship. This means we have to do this too. <laughs> right? Because if Paul had said this, had made things black and white, we would know immediately if we were all good with God and in God's eyes when it came to giving and generosity. And yet, Paul also knows that Jesus Christ came to set us free. Free from bondage, free from being held captive, even by the law meant to bring freedom. Paul is saying your generosity is inspired by your eagerness to live a Christ-like life. Your generosity is inspired by the Holy Spirit within you and by what you truly have to give. Verse 12 says, For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. 
Paul doesn't tell them what to give because Paul knows everyone's circumstances are different. And he wants them to give however they can. And the percentage isn't what matters to him in his understanding of generosity. And by listening for the Holy Spirit's guidance on how you're being called to give back to God. As we delve further into our stewardship series, the question around us is, where is God calling you to completing it according to your means? Elder Rich Hazler is going to tell us more about the importance of our generosity with this congregation throughout our stewardship series, right? So Paul is leading us to think about our desire for giving because the eagerness behind giving is more important than the amount actually given to the cause of supporting the Christians in Jerusalem. Which means for us that our eagerness, our emotions towards giving are just as important as what we pledge to give or what we truly give. As I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon, right, we aren't a pay-to-play or pay-as-you-go place. Instead, we're a congregation that works together to try and shine Jesus' light into the world. We're united by Christ and we share our offerings, our talents, and our time to bolster this congregation in this community. And as you consider your pledge for the 2025 year, consider how you're feeling when you make that pledge. Are you feeling glad at the chance to support the congregation financially? If not, what's causing your hesitation to give? Is the Holy Spirit directing you to to give in a different way? Could your eagerness in giving be more focused on doing something for the church, like being a liturgist? Hosting the Zoom meeting, teaching Sunday school, taking charge of the weeding around the church property. The list of ways you can give back to the congregation as part of your stewardship goes well beyond the money that you're considering giving next year. That's why you receive two pledge cards, right? The one for monetary resources and the one to help in the leadership and facilitation of the congregation. So friends, prayerfully consider where your eagerness lies as you consider Paul's explanation on the importance and reasoning for giving. Amen. Our next congregational song is Lead On, Good Shepherd. So please stand as you are able in body or spirit to join in our song. It is printed in the bulletin and on the screen. turned around but I've never been lost seen the water get troubled but we walked across when my knees were shaking you held my hand turning my problems to a promised land lead on good shepherd you make a way you've walked me through the valley but you never steered me wrong lead on good shepherd lead on seen some mighty deep canyons that you brought me through seen some mighty big mountains that just up and moved Glory, glory, hallelujah, 
yeah, that's my song. Walking with my father into the great unknown. Lead on, good shepherd, I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You've walked me through the valley, but you never steered me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. Step by step, day by day, lead me on, Lord, I pray. Road gets dark, walk by faith. Lead on, good shepherd, step by step, day by day. Lead me on, Lord, I pray. Road gets dark. Walk by faith, lead on, good shepherd, 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 lead on. remain standing and join me in our affirmation of faith the Apostles Creed as found in your bulletin I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we will share our joys and concerns, and after each one, please repeat, God of mercy, hear our prayer. Is there anyone here in the congregation? I ask for prayers for Mike Costco, who's uh, enduring uh, severe back problems. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Donna. Yes, and I'd like to ask prayers for Bob. He's having a procedure done on Wednesday. God of mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Okay. Charlie? Oh, hang on a second, Charlie. We're gonna, I'm going to go here first and see a shorter walk. <laughs> uh, I'd like to pray for my wife, Linda, who's going to be traveling to Colorado this week to visit with Pam and Dennis Fielding and their new granddaughter. God of mercy, mercy hear our prayer. prayer. I know you got the voice for it, Charlie, but we'll give you this anyway. <laughs> I, I know everybody listens to television and probably reads newspapers and things like that. And it would be easy for me to stand here and say, let's pray for our country. But, and that's the easy part. But we're heading into a season that we choose new leaders, okay? Let's pray about all of that in that it leads America in the right way, the best way, God's way, and uh, we can sit back and be quiet for a moment and realize that in the quietness of God's land and God's heart, maybe something good will happen. Let's pray for our country. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We'll check on Zoom. See if anyone... Let's see. Uh, possibly Betty, but we'll see here. No, we're on computer audio. Yep. Go ahead, Betty. I just want to 
was it Charlie who just spoke about our country? I want to double that, triple that. Oh gosh, yes, please. God of mercy, hear our prayer. I see. I see Walt's on this week, so Walt, it's great to see you. <laughs> the church. Hi, Walt. I'll uh, ask for. I was going to say, I'll uh, also ask for travel mercies as I head to Scotland, so for uh, 10 days. Looking forward to it. God of mercy, hear our prayer. The land that was the birth of golf. <laughs> <laughs> with these in mind, with the joys and the sorrows and the worries being shared, let us turn our hearts to prayer. Good and gracious God, Thank you for the many blessings and gifts you have given us, especially the gift of grace in Jesus Christ. Forgive us when we hoard what you have given us because we are worried we won't have enough. Help us trust in your promise of eternal life here and now, that we may live obedient, joyful, and faithful lives as your children in your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that Jesus looks at us in love as he calls us to follow him. Give us the courage to heed his call and to go where he leads us. Help us embrace the new life he offers, where the last shall be first and the greatest will be servant of all, even as Christ came to serve us in love. Almighty God, in a world where there is great need, free us from our attachment to the many things that occupy us and demand our various loyalties. Give us grateful hearts and willing spirits so that our lives and actions reflect the self-giving love of your, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we trust Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, enough to follow him in your kingdom. God, we pray for our country especially as we look towards the election day and the following times. God, help us all to trust our neighbor, to see your image made in each of us, to know that through it all, our only hope can really be placed on you, no matter whom is elected. God, may we trust in you and your plan and help us to live our lives as Christ-like as we can, regardless of who is elected to lead our country. Divine Creator, we also pray for our community, for Mike and his back problems, for Bob's procedure on Wednesday, for Linda traveling to Colorado to celebrate the birth of a new grandbaby for Pam and her husband Dennis. We also pray for Eric as he heads to Scotland this week and his time while he's there. God, we offer these and all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is another typo. I now call forward Rich Hazler for a moment for mission, which was not going to go between the joys, concerns, and the prayer, but it's to go now. Thank you, Rich. Good morning. This is going to be short, uh, but I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for uh, the money that you contributed to the Peace and Global Witness offering. We'll have the figure for that next week. Uh, now we're going to change Minute for Mission to Minute for Stewardship. This week you're going to be receiving in the mail your, your giving a, as uh, of September 30th, and there'll also be a letter from me kind of outlining the next two weeks that uh, I'll be talking about uh, stewardship and kind of 
give you the, uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, where we stand as a congregation with our, our giving and, uh, and our future here at the Presbyterian Church in Sussex County. Uh, the other responsibility is the, the session to make sure that we use uh, the things that in this church uh, as good stewards to make sure that we're using them uh, appropriately and that we use them to their fullest extent. You can take a look at that candle. That candle was there when I, I think we joined in 1978. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, as, an, as an elder in the church, we, we do value your contributions to the church and we do uh, use them to the best way possible. So I urge you to um, read the letters that you're getting during the next uh, two weeks and also ask questions at, at our meeting, meeting here at worship next Sunday and the following Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Above all, God desires a humble heart. One way we show our humility is by giving back to God through the church a portion of what we've been blessed with. We do this financially as well as through our time and our talents. So let's give with our whole selves to our loving God. in prayer of dedication. Use the gifts we give you in worship today, O oh God, and in our lives as a whole to strengthen our commitment to you and your plan for this world. Bless our offerings to do your good work in this world, starting with each one of us. In and through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We will now share our announcements. The biggest one is, of course, there's a potluck. If you walk into the room over there, the bathroom hallway, I don't know what you want to call it, it smells delightful, <laughs> delicious, delectable. Can you tell I'm hungry? And so you are invited to join in the potluck, whether or not you brought a dish, there will be plenty of food to eat and fellowship to enjoy. So yes, you are invited 
to that time of extended fellowship through the potluck and the bingo game. You do not have to stay for the bingo game if you do not want to, but there are prizes and it'll be a fun time. I upgraded the bingo board from last, from last time. A little enticement maybe. Um, let me see. Other announcements. Session is this week. So if you're an elder on session, you'll be getting the email on Tuesday with the Zoom link. Um, college care packages uh, will be put together at the end of this month. So please, we need donations for the care packages, as well as people to send the care packages to. So please give the names, addresses, etc., as listed in the bulletin so that people, college students can know that this church community is thinking of them and caring about them during that time in their life. Um, yeah, remember, she put this in here early, I guess, to fill spots, but the time change is coming soon. We're about to leave savings time and enter back into standard time. So make sure to take a look at that and remember to change your clocks because we fall back on November 2nd into November 3rd. So please remember to do that. It's in your bulletin. I'm sure it'll be the next few weeks. Any other announcements? I see Charlie standing here. Do you have an announcement? Uh, Sheila just walked, Sheila Storms just walked in and she's now left. I believe she went downstairs. Prayers are needed. It's really not an announcement. It's prayers are needed. She's going into the hospital tomorrow for a heart operation. So, and some of us, by the way, have already been through that. So please take an opportunity when you're on your knees tonight to pray for her. She's going in the hospital tomorrow. Okay? Heart operation. Sheila Storms. Thank you, Charlie. Sheila will be having her heart operation tomorrow for the people on Zoom who may not have heard Charlie. So definitely include her in your prayers. Um, oh, Linda. And I have I failed to mention that um, Pam and Dennis Fielding became, became grandparents on September 18th. Leah, their daughter, um, who many of you know, gave birth to a little girl and she was seven pounds and her name is um, Evie. Thank you for the information about uh, Pam and Dennis's granddaughter. Um, so our next hymn, once again, the last typo in the bulletin. Gotta love those typos. The Holy Spirit keeps me humble week in, week out. Hopefully this week I'll remember the benediction. So uh, it's actually 357, not 67. So the board appears correct. Eric's slides are correct. It's 300. 57, O oh Master, let me walk with thee. So please stand as you are able in body or spirit to join in our closing hymn this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
benediction, please join me in a word of prayer to bless our food that we will enjoy together. God, we thank you that so many hands have come together to prepare this meal for us this day. May your spirit connect us as we eat and play. In your name we pray, amen. So friends, go out into the world to recognize the calling of generosity the Holy Spirit has placed upon your hearts. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. is still there i'm still here oh eric i was we were <laughs> questioning whether the, our pictures are still on the wall or is that not there anymore <laughs> oh i didn't they're not up on the wall anymore but i can change that if you like i mean have they been up on the wall during service no i don't usually put them up during the whole service just during the joys and concerns oh that's okay i see betty betty and i didn't know for sure yeah, I usually don't um, put that's them okay. up during. That's just as wise. Yeah. I don't have people be distracted, you know, with my movement around. Sometimes we do, but but having them on for the joys and concerns is a very good idea. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There. Sometimes people forget we're there at all. No, I get it. <laughs> have a wonderful time. I wish I was. Um, I've never been to Scotland. It's too oh long. no! Okay, well. Love to hear those people talk. I just love it. <laughs> it's my second trip, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, that sounds wonderful. You enjoy it. Have it. Have a safe, safe trip, and we'll keep you in our prayers. Oh, thank you. Yep. Hey, Walt, how are you? Pretty good. I've never been to Scotland, but I've seen it. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful country. It's going to be. Great. It's very green. Border, I was right across the border in England. I could see it from where I was, but yeah. How well, are you feeling, Walter? Uh, still not in the hospital. Oh, is in the hospital now? No, nope, I'm at home and oh, I'm okay. in the hospital I can't tell more than a month. So I'm pretty pleased. Well, I'm glad that things are going well. Hi, hi Rich. Hi. hi. How's everybody doing? So far, so good. Good, good. Great to see you. And Walter, good, to, great to see you. How, how are you? Well, oh, the house is sold. Oh, congratulations! I guess that's that's a good feeling. <laughs> now I can pay for Paula. Oh, good. That's great. Hey, Walter. Hey, kid. How you doing? Okay. Good to see you. Yep. Good to be here. Good to be. Here. Good to be seen, right? Anywhere, I tell you, I was a little concerned there for a while. Yeah. We all were. Yeah. But we're glad to see you. I'm, I'm glad. All... Yeah. We're so. Walter, where are you? In that city, at my daughter's house. Okay. <clears throat> I was in Utica two weeks ago. I went right through um, uh, Schenectady. Okay. That's a nice yeah. little town. I miss Sussex. Oh, we, well, we miss you too. And that's right. 
Yeah, it's, we miss everybody who, who's uh, yeah, not able to Betty be here. Yeah, we're Betty and Martin. We're missing all of you. Yeah, it's Paul great. Young. We I'm think of you all Mike, the time. Mike, how are you feeling today? <laughs> Mike, how's your back? Um, I was almost ready to make it. I was all dressed to go to church, and I went to about 5 after 10. I went to get up from the chair, and I went. Oh, know, boy. Oh. Yeah. Well, we well, my camera on phone. right now, you'd see me laying in bed. Uh, uh, ways nice to, that you were able to come time. on. We appreciate you know. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Nice that that's great. Have. I saw Karen at physical therapy. May, maybe you oh, could yeah, come. Yeah, saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can come join her. Well, uh, <laughs> we talk about that. I went to the uh, neurologist this weekend and on Tuesday, and I said, uh -huh. you know, she's going to see me. She's going to go. Well, you know, you got to go back to the hospital and all this stuff. I said, if I went down to the hospital, I said, I don't want to go back to the rehab place because I said, for basically, you know, the half hour rehab and 23 and a half hours of staying in bed, I said, I can do that at home. You know? Right. So, I hear you. Yeah. So we'll see. Well, I wish you all were here. We're going yes. downstairs to have a potluck. We wish Enjoy you could be it. here. Enjoy it. It sounds Thanks. delicious and it sounds like a lot of fun. It's nice to get together. I think there should be more fellowships. Yeah. Well, it's fun. It's it's a lot of work, but it's fun. We try. Yeah. So we'll see you. Yeah. Great to see you all. Love you all. Love, Good to see you all. Have a wonderful day. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Talk to you on Tuesday. Walt, is, is it possible that I could give you a call and just talk to you?